Galatians chapter 2, if you would look there, please. We're going to set our focus this morning on verses 15 and 16, but I want us to read beginning with verse 11 down to verse 21. But when Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. For before certain men came from James, he was eating with the Gentiles. But when they came, he drew back and separated himself, fearing the circumcision party. And the rest of the Jews acted hypocritically along with him, so that even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. But when I saw that their conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas before them all, If you, though a Jew, live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you force the Gentiles to live like Jews? We ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners. Yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law, because by works of the law, no one will be justified. But if in our endeavor to be justified in Christ, we too were found to be sinners, is Christ then a servant of sin? Certainly not. For if I rebuild what I tore down, I prove myself to be a transgressor. For through the law, I died to the law so that I might live to God. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not nullify the grace of God. For if justification were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. Verses 15 and 16 again say this, We ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners. Yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law, because by works of the law no one will be justified. Let's pray together. Lord, now we ask your blessing on this time that we have around your word. May the Holy Spirit himself be our teacher in this hour. Take your sword in hand, Lord, and deal with our hearts. We know that your word is living, it's active, it's sharper than any two-edged sword. It goes down into our innermost being. It makes manifest the thoughts and the intentions of our hearts. And so, Lord, we ask you to do a a work in us this morning that is truly life-changing. Encourage your people. Lord, remind us of how you have saved us and convict the lost and help, Lord, that they would understand their need today for your son. We ask you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. There is nothing more important than the true gospel. There is nothing about which we should feel more passion as God's people. Nothing that we must defend more fiercely. And the book of Galatians not only tells us this, it models it. Anyone who has read the book of Galatians, anyone who has studied it at all, recognizes there's something different about this letter. I mean, the very beginning of it is different. Paul has barely said hello before he is moving with arguments. He is on the attack. Why is he so moved in this letter that anyone reading it can recognize that he is agitated? He is incensed. Paul is troubled. In fact, the word that he uses here is perplexed. He is perplexed because the Galatians are in danger of forsaking the true gospel to embrace a message that is not the gospel at all. And as I think about that, I wonder, where is that passion in today's church? Do we see the gospel being distorted all around us in the name of Christianity? Do we see the gospel watered down? Do we see the gospel not preached clearly and forcefully in all of its truth? And if we're witnessing that, if we're seeing that, my question is, where is our passion for the purity of the gospel. Is the question whether or not the urgency of this message has been lost, in other words, it's not that important that we protect it, or is the question 
one of us losing our sense of the urgency of the issue. Is it urgent that we defend the purity of the gospel? Has that changed? I believe it is still urgent. Or have we lost our sense of urgency about it? When you come to chapter 2, verses 15 through 21, you really have the entire book of Galatians in a capsule form. Ramsey said that after you've read the entire book, if you just come back here to these verses, 15 through 21, you would have it all captured right here. This is the book of Galatians, verses 15 through 21, in a capsule form. It's interesting to me, the most famous statement in this section is verse 20. We all know this very well, where Paul writes, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And there's no doubt that is an outstanding statement. It is his personal testimony. It is the Christian experience in its essence. But let us never forget that verse 20 could never have been written. It would never have been true if verses 15 and 16 were not true. What you have in verse 20 is Paul's personal experience of the truth of the gospel that is expressed in verses 15 and 16. And so what I want us to do this morning together is I want us to look at verses 15 and 16, and I want us to remember what the true gospel is. And as we do that, I want us to ask ourselves if we are passionate about protecting the purity of this message. God has entrusted the gospel to us. Do we sense the urgency of maintaining the purity of it? Look what he says in verse 15. We ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners. Yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law, because by works of the law, no one will be justified. No one will be justified by works of the law. Now he's introduced those two verses by reminding us or telling us of something that happened between he and Peter when Paul was in Antioch. You see that in verse 11. He says, but when Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. Now what he's doing here in 11 through 14 is he's giving us an example of the urgency of the true gospel. How important is it that we protect the purity of the gospel? He says, well, let me tell you how important. When I was in Antioch, Cephas came and I had to oppose him to his face. This is a fellow apostle. I had to oppose him to his face because he stood condemned. Why did he stand condemned? Verse 12, because before certain men came from James, he was eating with the Gentiles. Here was a Jewish man who had been saved by faith in the Messiah, Jesus, and he had been taught by God that the dietary laws of the Old Testament no longer were important. What was important was faith in Christ. No longer regard that which is clean as though it were unclean. The Lord taught him that in a very powerful way. Peter had understood that. He had begun to live in light of that. He was eating with the Gentiles. But when they came, he drew back and separated himself, fearing the circumcision party. This is a matter of fear, the fear of man. This is a matter of racial pride. Verse 13, and the rest of the Jews acted hypocritically along with him. I mean, these are people who've been forgiven by God through faith in Jesus Christ and his finished work on the cross, they have been given eternal life as a free gift, and now they were beginning to behave as though they were going to be justified before God on the basis of law-keeping. Verse 13, so that even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. Why does he call it hypocrisy? Because they know better. They know what the gospel is. They know how one is justified before God, but they're behaving in a way contrary to that gospel. Verse 14, but when I saw that their conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel, when I saw that they were denying the message by their behavior, I said to Cephas before them all, see folks, some things deserve public rebuke. I said to Cephas in the presence of all of them, if you, though a Jew, live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, How can you force the Gentiles to live like Jews? When you have come to understand that the purpose of the law was to lead us like a tutor to Christ so that your trust is not in law keeping but in Christ, which means that he is the fulfillment of all those old ceremonial laws. If you've come to understand that and live in the light of that, 
then how can you now begin to say to Gentiles, you must be circumcised and you must observe these laws or else I'll have nothing to do with you. Their conduct was contrary to the gospel. Paul, why do you share this with us? Why do you tell us this account? Why do you tell us this story? Because before he talks about what the gospel is, he is telling us how important the truth of the gospel really is. It is so important that no matter who you are, and no matter what my relationship with you is, when you begin to distort the gospel, it must be put to a stop. When someone begins to distort the gospel, it must be dealt with head on, straight on. This is a message that God has given so that men might be reconciled to God. To distort the message is to doom souls so that not for a moment can we yield to that kind of distortion. No matter who you are, no matter what our relationship is, it cannot be overlooked. In fact, Paul included himself in that in the first chapter. Look back to Galatians chapter 1, and you know these verses very well, but it's good to be reminded of them in light of the urgency of what we're talking about in chapter 2. Chapter 1, verse 6, Paul writes, I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another one, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. Now notice, but even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be anathema. Let him be a curse that is devoted to destruction. Let that one be destroyed. And notice he says, if we do it, I mean, if an apostle of Jesus Christ distorts the gospel, let him be accursed. That includes Paul. Verse 9, as we said before, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. For am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? Or am I trying to please man? If I were still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. For I would have you know, brothers, that the gospel that was preached by me is not man's gospel. I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. I mean, this is God's truth, and you can't mess with it. You can't change it. You can't distort it. And if anyone does it, even an angel from heaven, don't receive them and don't receive what they're saying. That is an example of the urgency of keeping the gospel pure. Now look back at Galatians 2, verse 15. So what is the essence of the true gospel? And he's going to teach this to us against a backdrop, and the backdrop is the privilege of the Jewish people. Now, by the way, let me just say this. There's debate about where Paul's conversation with Cephas ends. Some believe it ends at verse 14, so that beginning with verse 15, Paul is teaching us in light of that conversation. Some believe that his conversation with Cephas actually continues all the way down to the end of verse 21, so that what we're being given in verses 15 through 21 is the continuation of what he said to Cephas on this occasion. I agree with someone who said that actually what it appears is happening is Paul moves from that story into teaching and almost unconsciously moves from the conversation into his own instruction. In a sense, it doesn't matter where the conversation ends. What matters is what he's saying to us. And he says in verse 15, we ourselves, he and Cephas and any other Jewish believer, this is true, we ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners. I mean, we were given, he says, real privilege. And when he says Gentile sinners, he's taking into his mouth the attitude of the Jewish people toward Gentiles. And he says, we were not Gentile sinners by birth. We know that. We were Jews by birth. And by the way, that involved real privilege wasn't imaginary privilege. It was real privilege. What people on the face of the earth can claim the kind of favor from God that the Jewish people can claim. You think about the promises that have been made to their fathers. You think about the way that God chose them out and blessed them in the way that he did. I mean, what other people can talk about the Exodus? He can talk about the parting of the Red Sea. He can talk about the parting of the Jordan River. He can talk about the ways that God made himself known to them, pillar of fire and cloud and the giving of the law and God's presence on a mountain and in a burning bush when it came to Moses and all the ways, the conquering of the city of Jericho, all the ways that God dealt favorably toward this people. 
And the chief way that he dealt with them in a favorable way was the giving of his oracles, the giving of his word. Not only privilege by birth, but privilege by revealed religion. God revealed himself to this people. Romans 3.1 says, then what advantage has the Jew or what is the value of circumcision? Paul says, much in every way. And then he says this, to begin with, or chiefly, the Jews were entrusted with the oracles of God. Out of all the world, here was this group of people who were given by God revelation of himself. Romans 9, Paul returns to that again. Verse 1, I'm speaking the truth in Christ. I'm not lying. My conscience bears me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were a curse and cut off from Christ. For the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen, according to the flesh, they are Israelites, and to them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, and the promises. To them belong the patriarchs, and from their race, according to the flesh, is the Christ, who is God over all, blessed forever. Amen. That is privilege. And Paul writes right here in verse 15, we ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners. What's the next word? Yet, in spite of that privilege, we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. Now you need to know something. This is really an amazing thought, and you may want to make note of this in your Bible. In verses 15 and 16, you have the first appearance in the book of Galatians of three very important subjects. First of all, for the first time, the word justification is mentioned in this letter. Second, for the first time, he talks about the works of the law. And third, for the first time, he talks about salvation being through faith. All three of those are mentioned for the first time in verses 15 and 16. He has talked about what is troubling him. He's talked about the urgency of all the issues. And now what he's doing is he's coming to the heart of the gospel. This is what we must contend for. We ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners. Yet we know that a person is not justified, first mention of that word, by works of the law, first time that's done, but through faith in Jesus Christ, first time that's mentioned. Now, what is justification? He's talking about salvation from the standpoint of justification. What is justification? It is a declaration. It's a term borrowed from the legal realm, and it has to do with a declaration or a sentence. Justification is a declaration of righteousness. It is being declared righteous before God. To be justified in this sense It's for God to declare you to be right in his sight. He thinks of you as righteous or considers you to be righteous and as a result then declares you to be righteous before himself. That is justification. Now you've heard that before, but think about this. For God to declare you righteous involves a standard, doesn't it? It has to. If he declares you righteous, he's declaring you to be something before himself. To say you're righteous before him means you're what? What is righteousness? He declares you to be righteous, but what does that mean? There has to be a standard. So what is the standard of righteousness? Well, there's only one who's righteous, right? That's God himself. We're talking about God's righteousness. We're talking about God's perfections. We're talking about God's holiness, Mark 10, 18, Jesus said to that rich young ruler, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. Romans 3, 10, as it is written, None is, what? Righteous. No, not one. I mean, by God's standard of righteousness, there is no human being who is righteous. Not even one. There is no one who is good. Romans 3.23 says it this way, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We all miss the mark. We all fall short of God's glory. His goodness, His righteousness, His holiness. So that when God declares you to be righteous... What he's saying is that you now stand before him in his estimation. You stand before him in his own perfect 
righteousness. You stand before God with the same righteousness that is His. He has declared you to be perfectly right with Himself. You have to be very careful. It is not God making someone righteous. We're not talking about righteousness infused. We're talking about righteousness imputed, put to your account. Again, we're talking in a legal realm. God accounts it unto you. He reckons you to be righteous. He has taken his righteousness and he has given it to you as a gift from the standpoint of your standing before him. This is not to say that God will not make his people righteous because he will. He is conforming us to the image of his son and one day we will bear the image of the son of God. And right now in sanctification, we're being grown into that image. We're being conformed to the image of his son. God is building his righteousness in our lives through the work of the Holy Spirit since conversion. But this isn't about that. This isn't about our experience. This is about our standing. To be justified is to have God declare you to be righteous by the standard of his own righteousness in his sight. Here's the question, though. How? How is one justified? How can a sinful human being, sinful by nature, sinful in our choices, violators of the law of God, by nature deserving of God's wrath, having violated the law of God, deserving of all of the death sentences that are associated with our sins, how can we who deserve death be declared righteous with God's own righteousness? How can that happen? And how can God do this and still be just? How can God be true to his own legal standards and declare us to be right with him? And you talk about the gospel concentrated. What Paul does here is he actually answers that question, how is one justified before God? He answers that question three times in one verse. He answers it, first of all, in general, then he answers it from the standpoint of a Jew, then he answers it from the standpoint of the whole world. First of all, notice he answers this in general, verse 16, yet we know, Jewish believers have come to understand this, that a person, you see that? A person, any person, a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. Any person, doesn't matter who we're talking about, they are not, stating it negatively, they are not justified. They are not declared righteous before God by works of the law. And there's no definite article there in the Greek text. He's not talking necessarily about the law of Moses. He's talking about any kind of law. We are not justified before God based on human deeds, based on human law keeping, based upon keeping law. In other words, anyone who is trying to earn their way to heaven is doomed. Anyone who thinks of themselves as somehow achieving a righteous standing before God, achieving merit before God, they are doomed. It's not by works of the law. Well, then how does it happen? It's through faith, but through faith. Now, again, here we need to be precise. We need to be careful. Faith is not the source of justification. It's the means. You say, what do you mean? Well, here's what I mean. God doesn't look at your faith as though it were a work. He doesn't say, you have faith, and that has merit in my sight. So because you have faith, I count that to be good. I count that to have merit before me, and so I will declare you righteous because of the goodness of your faith. No, that would make faith the source of justification. Justified because God is pleased with your faith. You've somehow earned it with your faith. No, that's wrong. Faith is not the source of justification. It's just the means. It's the way that justification comes to us according to God's plan. Faith is not a work. Faith is not a work. It would be like if you owed me a great debt and somehow I knew a way because I wanted to do it. If I knew a way to forgive you of all of that debt that you owed me in a way that was still just, it still represented what is truly right. And I found a way to forgive you of all the debt that you owed me. But in addition to wiping your debt off the books, I wanted to give to you unimaginable riches 
But in order for this transaction to occur, it involved me handing to you a certificate that you would have to take with your hand. I mean, it's not going to take place unless you receive it. We would not look at your simply reaching out your hand and receiving that certificate. We would not say that's the reason why all these riches belong to you. We would not say, well, it's because you're such a good receiver. Well, you do that so well, you know, open your hand up to receive that certificate. That's why. No, no one in their right mind would ever attribute that forgiveness and those riches to your ability to open up your hand and receive a certificate. It's just the means. It's not the reason for it. It's not the source of it. It's just the means. Now, one might ask, why did God choose faith to be the means? I think the answer is clear because the very essence of faith, which is trust, the very essence of trust is to look away from yourself and to look to someone else. The means is in keeping with the act, isn't it? This is God doing something for us. This is God doing something apart from our work so that the means of receiving it itself is in keeping with what God is doing. It is us looking away from us and looking to him, not trusting in ourselves, but trusting in him. That's what faith is. But notice this isn't just any kind of faith. How is one justified before God? Not by works of the law, but through faith, and not just any kind of faith. Notice, faith in Jesus Christ. The true gospel and true faith have as their object Jesus Christ. It is trust in a person. It's not just mental assent to a set of facts. You know, here are the facts. Here's what God did for sinners, and I sign off on that in my mind, so now I'm right with God. No, it's trust in the person of Jesus himself. The one who came from heaven, the one who lived a sinless life after being born of a virgin, the God-man, the one who died on the cross for sinners, the one who's been raised from the dead and lives forevermore, the one who walks in the midst of his churches so that he's in our very presence this morning. It is loving him whom we have not seen. It is trusting in him, his work, to make us right in the sight of God, his shed blood forgiving our sins, his righteousness being imputed to our account through faith. You see, what righteousness is it that we receive from God as a gift? It is the righteousness of his own son, which is God's own righteousness. This is how we're able to stand before the Lord in his own righteousness. He gives to us as a gift through faith, the very righteousness of his own son. Someone has put it this way, and I think it's to put it very well. God treated his son on the cross just as if he had lived my life. And then after believing on the Lord Jesus Christ, trusting in him, God treats me in this life and for the rest of eternity just as if I had lived his son's life. Isn't that amazing? That God would treat his son as if he had lived my life, and now he treats me as if I had lived the life of Jesus. That is to be justified. So in the case of any person, Paul says, it's not by works that someone is justified. It's through faith in Jesus Christ. But now notice he doesn't stop there. We would think, well, that's enough. That says it, doesn't it? Notice, so we also, we also, we Jews, the Jews also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law. What's true of any person, Paul says, we, Peter, you and I, and all the Jewish believers, we have come to recognize that what is true of any person, despite our privilege, despite being born Jews, despite not being Gentile sinners by birth, we had to come the same way. To be saved, we had to understand That it's belief in Christ Jesus that brings justification before God. It's by faith in Christ, not by works of the law. We believed in Christ. We looked to Christ for justification before God, which means we had to look away from works. You can't trust in Christ until you're finished trusting in you. This is what has been described as a naked trust in Christ. I mean, I have no other hope. I have nowhere else to look. There is no one else, nothing else that could ever make me right before God. 
There is absolutely nothing within me that is good. There's nothing within me that measures up to God's righteousness. If I stand before God in myself, I am doomed to the opposite of justification, which is condemnation. In myself, I am condemned before God. How can I be declared right with God? It is only in His Son. And beloved, as soon as we realize this, we understand that man's best works are actually his greatest sins. His best works are his greatest sins. You say, how could that be? Well, because whatever man praises himself for actually shuts him off from the only way that he can be made right with God, and that's God's grace, right? If I imagine that there's something good in me that makes me self-reliant, if I imagine that there's some merit in something I do, whether it be giving money or being kind to someone, I mean, the best works that I could ever produce, if I'm praising myself in my mind for those things, it shuts me off from seeing what a desperate sinner I truly am and the fact that the death of Christ is the only hope I have for the forgiveness of my sins and the righteousness of Christ is the only hope I have of being accepted by God so that my best works become my greatest sins because they praise me and blind me to the fact that I am a sinner to the core. Even the best things I've ever done outside of Christ, in the final analysis, I did for myself. They were not done for God. They were not done for His glory. They were not done trusting in Him. They were not done relying upon Him. They were not done in His power and in His strength. They were centered on me, and they are filthy before holy God. How is one justified before God? Not by human deeds, but by faith, and not by faith in faith, and not by some kind of vague faith in God, but by a specific trust in Jesus Christ himself who loved us, died for us, and has been raised for us. It is faith in him. And faith is not the source of that justification. It's just the means. So that justification is a gift, not earned, freely given. And what is true of any person is just as true for the Jews. Despite their privilege, despite their birth, despite the ways that God has favored them, they must come just like a Gentile sinner. There's no difference. Is that enough, Paul? Do we have the message yet? No, it's not enough. He has one more statement for us. End of verse 16. Because by works of the law, now notice what he says, no one, and that is literally no flesh, By works of the law, no flesh will be justified. This is a universal statement. Any and all, everyone, on the face of this planet today, this is true to say, no one, no flesh, will stand right before God on the basis of what they have done. No one. It is a universal statement. It is a final statement. It is a warning statement. If you believe that one day you will be declared right before God on the basis of what you do, you will find that instead you are condemned. He's quoting here, it appears, from Psalm 143. Psalm 143, verse 1 says this, a psalm of David, Hear my prayer, O Lord. Give ear to my pleas for mercy. In your faithfulness, answer me in your righteousness. Enter not into judgment with your servant, for no one living is righteous before you. No one living, no flesh is righteous before you. I want you to look over to Romans chapter 3, if you would, please. And Paul makes the exact same case here in Romans 3, beginning with verse 9. What then? Are we Jews any better off? No, not at all, for we have already charged that all, both Jews and Greeks, are under sin. As it is written, none is righteous, no, not one. No one understands, no one seeks for God, all have turned aside, together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. 
Their throat is an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive. The venom of asps is under their lips. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. In their paths are ruin and misery and the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Verse 19, now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law so that every mouth may be stopped and the whole world may be held accountable to God. For by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight since through the law comes the knowledge of sin. What is the law meant to do? To save you? No, it's meant to shut your mouth. You would stop praising yourself. You would stop talking about what's good in you. The law is meant to reveal your sin, that it would shut the whole world's mouth and the whole world would recognize its guilt before God. And if we're all guilty, then how can we be made right? Verse 21, but now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, that is not by law keeping, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, even the law testifies to this righteousness. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by His grace. Why would God ever, ever make this way of salvation possible? It is just His grace. He didn't need it. He doesn't owe it to us. He could have condemned us all and not owed anybody an apology and not have done anything wrong. It is His grace so that we're justified, verse 24, by His grace as a, what? Gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. It required the redemptive work of Christ to be just. Someone had to pay for our sins and the God-man did it whom God, verse 25, put forward as a propitiation by His blood. Do you know what propitiation is? It is the turning away of wrath. God devised this way of salvation to turn his own wrath away from all those who will trust in his son. He did it by his son's own blood so that we would not be under the wrath of God. To be received by faith, this was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins. That is, you had Old Testament saints who had trusted and they were forgiven, and they were in heaven. But where's the payment for their sins? Animal blood won't do it. Well, when God's Son came, and when He died on the cross, God showed His righteousness in forgiving all those past saints. You see, He forgave them all on the promise of the coming and the death of His Son. Verse 26, it was to show His righteousness at the present time, so that He might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. God can justify us and be just at the same time because His Son paid the full price. What does this mean for us? For us who have believed, it means there's no boasting, is there? Verse 27, then what becomes of our boasting? It is excluded. By what kind of law? By a law of works? No, but by the law of faith. What humbles a man? What takes away all of his boasting? Law keeping? No, he praises himself when he's law keeping. But the law of faith, the truth of salvation by grace through faith in Christ, that removes boasting. Verse 28, for we hold that one is justified by faith apart from works of the law. Or is God the God of Jews only? Is he not the God of Gentiles also? Yes, of Gentiles also, since God is one. He will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith. Do we then overthrow the law by this faith? By no means. On the contrary, we uphold the law. This is in complete agreement with the law's message and the law's purpose. Folks, that's the gospel. Not saved by works, but saved by Christ. Received by believing in Him. Does it result in a changed life? Absolutely. Does it become experience? Yes. But first we must see it in its legal sense. So that we come to Christ trusting in a naked fashion in Him alone to make us right with God. I want to ask you this morning, is that you? Have you come to see the depth and the breadth and the height and the depth of your sinfulness? Have you come to recognize there's really nothing good in you? There is nothing that would commend you to God? That salvation is not explained by God looking at you and saying, oh, there's someone really, really good and valuable. But that instead it is grace 
and kindness and mercy that would have God offer his only son on a cross to pay the price for all the sins of all who will trust in him so that you see yourself as simply a recipient of mercy in Christ Jesus. Do you realize you cannot even glory in your faith because your faith was a gift from God? Oh, you believed. You made a choice to trust in Jesus, but it's only because of a secret work of God in your soul where he granted you new birth. Because man is so wicked, so wicked, that left to himself, God could have done all of this and set it before him. And man still would not believe so that all of our glorying and all of our boasting can be centered in just one place. Praise be to God and his son and his grace for our salvation. If you agree with that, would you say amen?